Welcome to season three and episode four of the Smarketing Talk podcast produced by Landscape Leadership. I am your host, Chad Diller. I'm the director of client success here at Landscape Leadership, and I'm joined by our CEO and founder, Chris Heiler. If you own or work for a company in the lawn and landscape industry, you are in the right place. This is where we share our candid thoughts on sales and marketing as it relates to companies just like yours. So thank you for joining us. So Chris, uh, part of our roles, you know, here are that we, we each participate in the sales process, different parts of it. And um, I know uh, one of the funny things that I've often told my friends when they find out that sales is part of my job is I often say that I'm a salesperson that doesn't like being sold to by salespeople. <laughs> Can you identify with that? Yeah. First, welcome everybody. Uh, yeah, I can identify that with that a little bit, especially, you know, being a business owner, I feel like I'm probably sold to more than the average person just because I'm always approached by, you know, people trying to sell the B2B salespeople who tend to be really annoying. Yeah. Either they go right for it or they're really nice and you think they're just trying to be friendly and then all of a sudden, boom, there comes a pitch. Yeah. I've had some really bad experiences with B2B sales, salespeople, and I've had, you know, I've had some really great experiences too, but the, the great experiences are definitely fewer, far between, I would say. Like, I really notice it. When I have a good experience, I really notice it. How about you? You've- yeah, it's a hard thing to do. Um, you know, I was in sales in the long landscape industry for seven years of part of my last 13 year uh, stint at a company and we do sales now too. And I'm constantly talking to salespeople, our clients, I deal with, you know, some of them that have that as part of their jobs. Um, It's funny. We were talking about doing this, this topic, this, this week for the podcast. Um, It it reminded me actually of a kind of a amusing story. Uh, Recently, I wanted to get my maple tree trimmed outside my house in the front of my house. I wanted it crown thinned for you industry people out there Ooh, and, crown, and nice. crown raised. Yes. I know Ooh, my stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I wanted to have this done. So I had two companies in mind, uh, locally that I wanted to have bid on the work. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'll give them both a chance. So I called company number one. Um, actually one of the guys that I was ta- connected to on LinkedIn, he, he worked at this company. So we were, we were chatting. I said, Hey, I need an estimate. Send him an estimate. Um, about a week went by, I didn't hear anything. Um, I request for an estimate, nothing. Um, so I thought, all right, you know what? I'll give the guy a benefit of the doubt. I hit him up on social media. It's probably a nice process. I'll call their office or, or go through a website. I think I went through a website and filled out a form and I uh, got the response back. They were going to give me an estimate. So I think, um, a couple of days went past and I thought, all right, I'm gonna call this other company too, because, you know, give them a shot of a relationship with them and, uh, got them to give me an estimate. So Company number two comes back with an estimate. We did probably another week, still didn't see that estimate from company number one. A few weeks pass, they come out, they trim, they prune my tree. It looks amazing. And one week later, company one responds to me to ask me if they can schedule an appointment for my estimate. That's, that's, (laughs) that's great, right? (laughs) Um, I was like, that makes for a really awkward conversation. Yeah. I'm like, well, the tree's already been been pruned by the time you finally called me for an estimate and they were apologetic, but it just kind of made me laugh about some of the breakdown within salespeople and, you know, getting thrown off their game and that sort of thing. I know that, um, it's a tough job, uh, but there's a lot of this goes on. Yeah. I mean, sales is a tough job and like the scenario you just explained, it's, it's too bad that that kind of thing happens, but it's very common in our industry. And what's, what's sad about it in your situation is, like you said, you had a relationship with that company already. So that really should be an easy sale, right? All, yeah. that, all that guy needs to do is get back to you right away. And it's probably a pretty easy sale. Slammed on. Um, you're, yeah, you're not just calling them out of the phone book, if those even exist anymore. But I mean, you know what I mean. I mean, it's like that could have been avoided. But really, it's that's common in our industry and it happens all the time. And I think uh, 
it probably wasn't because that salesperson was being lazy or anything like that or didn't want the work. Right. That person probably had other priorities at the time, probably had other more urgent pressing matters that he or he had to take care of. So it took him a while to get back to you. Um, so that's a problem in our industry. Yeah, it's a big problem. I think for sales in general, you know, a lot of times the organizations, they give salespeople so many things to do. Um, so sales might be one of them. And depending upon the salesperson, that might be one of their favorite things to do or their least favorite things about their position. So I know that you have a lot to say on this topic. So without any further ado, here is Chris's hot take. Thank you, Chad. Yeah, so um, I had a conversation last week with a friend of mine who's back in Michigan, and he's been a landscape designer for probably the last, I think about 12 years with, uh, I'd say it's a medium-sized landscaping company. And he was talking to me about how he's burned out in his current role. And it's not from the design and the creative side, but it's but from all the other adjacent responsibilities on his plate. So from you know the estimating that he has to do to selling the work and even to the project management that comes with all of that, right? And, and even all the customer service involved with being a landscape designer. There's a lot of handholding that's involved with that throughout a project. So he's essentially doing everything but building the project. And I was a designer myself, some of you know. Uh, so I, I know how difficult it can be being a designer. You have a lot of different responsibilities. And landscape designers aren't the only professionals in our industry who are burdened with wearing many different hats. And often hats that really don't fit their skill set. Uh, so in this, in this hot take, I want to focus on how this relates to sales. And in my opinion, you know, our industry needs to reimagine how we sell our professional services. And that's from not just design build work, but, you know, design build lawn care to mowing, you know, to mowing a lawn. Um, and I think most importantly, who is responsible for doing the selling? You know, software engineers don't sell their own software, right? Experienced salespeople do. Talented salespeople sell the software. Like software companies like Oracle, Microsoft, Salesforce, HubSpot, right? These companies are valued, valued in the billions of dollars because of this. And there's other reasons, obviously. They're billion-dollar companies. But my point is the creative and technical people who are creating the software – they're not selling the software, uh, but that, but that is typical of what you'll find in our industry, right? Sales is just, it's it's just another bullet point in a bloated job description. Uh, uh, and I already we already talked about what this looks like for a landscape designer, but and you know this, Chad, we've worked with commercial landscape maintenance companies who rely on their account managers to bring in uh, new business. We've worked with lawn care and landscape maintenance companies who will lean on their administrative staff to handle inbound leads and even prepare proposals and essentially sell their services, right? These are administrative right. people that are asking to do this. Uh, it's the wrong approach. It leaves a ton of money on the table, but this is how it's done in our industry. Um, but like I said, it's the wrong approach. And that's because one can only serve one king. So when an urgent, for example, so when an urgent design decision needs to be made on a project, uh, the site visit becomes a priority for your landscape designer, right? She'll call that new lead back tomorrow. Or maybe she won't, right? Maybe she won't call that lead back. Instead of your account manager meeting with a new prospect from a referral she just got, she's on site putting out a fire for another client. That's just how it works. One can only serve one king. Sales 
takes a back seat to that which is more urgent. And I think that if someone's role includes sales, then that should be their primary strength and skill. So if you're asking a designer to sell, I would argue that their salesmanship is more important to your business's bottom line than their creativity and design jobs. And now maybe you can make an argument against that. And honestly, I mean, being a designer in my past life, it kind of pains me to say that, to think that maybe creativity isn't the most important thing in the world for a landscape designer role. Uh, but really, for if considering the business's bottom line, if you're going to ask the designer to sell, I think sales needs to be their primary strength. So, Chad, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this topic because I know you've seen this firsthand too in the oh, companies yeah. that you've worked with. Yeah, worked at, with, talked to. Um, the the conversations um, that I have are pretty uh, – pretty synonymous. You talk from one company and and they have that same person at another company. Um, I actually, I have, I have four instances here that I wanted to point out. I got oh boy. two guys and two gals, you know, so I wanted to be a little, you know, equal there. Um, these Bumble are, in, listeners. these are semi fictitious, but I, I have created some um, differences in, in the real life situation and changed their names. So okay. Um, okay. I, I want to be, you know, protect the innocent, but also don't want to discredit, you know, like this is hard work and everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. So yep. this isn't to poke, yep. poke fun or, or to say these are just real life situations. So, all right. So let's take our first case. Uh, Kate, she's a landscape designer. And I mean, she knows her plants, Latin names, where they grow, which spe- which cultivars, all that stuff grows better than others, which ones are redder than the other reds and, and all that. And she's <laughs> An artistic, one of a kind design. Like if you looked at any project she did, you would see very little things repeated. And she loves to sit in the office all day and draft up new designs. Uh, but she's terrible with calling people back. In fact, her coworkers complain that if someone calls the office and says, I'm trying to get in touch with someone, but they don't call me back, they're all willing to bet money that it's going to be her Kate because most of the time it is. So I wonder if I wonder if that reminds you of anyone at your company. So um so you could put you could put five new leads on Kate's desk and it's gonna be a few weeks before she calls them back. At least a couple days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so let's go to, let's go to the next uh, contestant here. Uh the next guy, we're gonna call him Jeremy. So Jeremy, he used to be a, a crew leader. He used to run some construction work and some maintenance work. Um, and he is all about the details. So he spends so much time going out to jobs he's already sold because he needs to make sure everything's exactly as he specified it, and no one can do the job better than he can. But Jeremy, he can't really seem to hit his sales quota because he feels like nothing's going to happen right if he's not involved with it and has his hands on it. Boy. Yeah. We know the Jeremys. We know the Jeremys. Um, Jody. Okay, so Jody. Jody answers almost all the calls that come into the company. Um, But her boss now has decided that they have this new tool where they can measure lawns online while people are on the phone. And he wants her to sell lawn care. She's got a really great phone voice. She's real chipper. But in the midst of all that, especially in the spring when she's getting, you know, 20 or 30 leads a day that are rolling in, because maybe they work with a marketing company that knows what they're doing. And they have all these leads. She also has to forward all these customer questions to people on the team. And she has to take care of scheduling issues, get those to the right people. And basically everyone else, technicians calling the office and, and all that stuff. So she's way overburdened. She's trying to do yep. sales and probably trying to get them off the phone and get on to the next call. And the yep. lights are lighting up and the phones are ringing and she's pulling her hair out. That's just she's kind of an order taker. She is. Point. She's like, okay, here's the price. Yeah. Um, this is what it'll cost you. Do you want to do it? No. Okay. I'll send you a proposal. Yep. And who knows how quick that goes out. All right. Our last contestant is Tim. Tim. He is the best networker around. You know, everybody in the local community seems to know Tim. In fact, they all want to play golf with him because his golf game <laughs> is so good. Right? Yeah. He has yep. tons of connections. Um, but he spends most of his weekends 
trying to play catch up because he has all these tedious estimates with lots and lots of details and calculations he needs to figure out. And sometimes he just gets so sick of this that he just starts to kind of fudge the numbers and make guesstimates and kind of slide bids in, which ultimately ends up getting on the radar of the production team and operations and his boss, and it gets into serious hot water. <laughs> so I, you might think I made these up, but I'm sure oh, that no. even if they're people that, that I've come acquainted with, either where I've worked or, or companies that we deal with now and stories I've heard, but they're in every company. You probably have maybe at least two of those in your company. Um, yeah. I'm very familiar with two of the four. Yeah, for sure. And, and like I said, it's, it's tough, you know, it's tough because everybody has certain strengths, you know? Um, and I think a great salesperson, even when they have strengths, they understand how to take their weaknesses and use, I once heard a, um, someone say that people use people processes and technology to fill in these gaps. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like you had said, you're talking about the people piece of this, meaning, you know what, if you're not good at follow-up calls, maybe there needs to be someone else in this sales organization that makes your follow-up calls for you. Um, if you are that person that is the business developer or you're the person that is the relationship person, maybe you should do what you do best and have other people that are actually doing the designs and drawing those sorts of things and work together as a collaborative team. Um, so the other piece of that is technology. So there, there's tools out there. Like we use tools for our own sales process, um, to make me remember to call people back nine months later, because that's what we agreed upon. And yep. I can look at the email that we went without digging through things. And there's all kinds of really cool technology tools. So I, I was connected on LinkedIn, uh, probably in the last month or two, uh, with a guy named Sean and Sean works um, for a software company, an industry software company. And he shares a lot of really, really great videos on LinkedIn about the sales process, uh, most often about technology. So here is a few minutes of my conversation with Sean. Well, you know, I think I'm personally a little bit picky about who I connect with on LinkedIn because there's a lot of content that goes out there. Um, I always love to connect with green industry people of all sorts. And I'm also, you know, a little skeptical sometimes when I, when I connect with industry consultants or people that are selling products, um, because I want to make sure that they're putting really good content out there. And I connected a few months ago, uh, with a guy named Sean Adams, who is an account executive from single ops, which is a business management software for the green industry. And Sean, it's been a pleasure to connect with you. I think one of the things that there's a couple of things that we, we love. Um, one of them is educating the industry and giving some really thoughtful insights. And the other thing I think that we have in common, uh, which we're not using today, is we like to use video uh, to do that. So I really appreciate you taking a few minutes and having a conversation today. Absolutely, I appreciate that introduction. Thanks for having me here, Chad. Sure, so, so today on the podcast, we're talking about a topic that's pretty much centralized around who should be selling at your lawn care landscaping company and some of the unique challenges that come in the midst of that when you deal with different types of people being involved in the sales process. Uh, people are imperfect, they forget, um, they have certain strengths and weaknesses and the role of people and processes and technology can really help with some of those weak spots because none of us are perfect and some of us do things better than others and we rely on some of these tools. So when we're talking about green industry salespeople, and, and Sean, I know that you've had your own company, you've worked with a lot of companies in the industry, so you're speaking from a point of experience. Where do you feel like is one of these big weak spots where salespeople in the green industry often lose opportunities? Yeah, I would say the biggest untapped area of opportunity, lost revenue, um, is really on the follow-up process. I find it to be vital. Almost every company that I talk to, when I bring up follow-ups, it's kind of them scratching their head like, well, what do you mean by that? I don't, you know, they call me, I win the job. If I don't hear from them, I lose the job. That's the two <laughs> statuses that I'm in. It's always a little bit of a frustration for me to see how much they leave out there on the, on the table uh, and just missing out on that. And so the logic I like to think about is, you know, if someone's spending a few thousand dollars on a project, 
investing in an installation in their backyard or just a full service landscape maintenance package, tree work, whatever it might be. What I find is the biggest competition that you face is typically indecision, especially as you scale up with the larger scale um, types of projects, because it's overwhelming, right? You have to select the vendor, you're picking the design, you're trying to find the color blend, the, the scheme, the scope of work. There's all these factors to consider. People are busy, people have other priorities, and it gets overwhelming and this decision fatigue kicks in. And so they end up when they get overwhelmed, they just table the decision because it's just too much for them to try to process and they, they wanna go on to something easy that they can make a decision on quickly. And so as the professional, if we can step in with a well-timed, well-messaged outreach, a follow-up message at that point about just reminding them bringing up maybe FAQs, frequently asked questions, kind of where you see most clients being at that time or in that decision-making process, I think it makes a huge difference because it shows that you care, that you're being proactive and that you actually have a process in which you track information. You don't just go out there and endlessly crack, uh, crank out these proposals and then just, if you win, great. If not, you know, you never really have any sort of touch point after that. I find it makes a huge difference and just being able to have that process in place and your clients will ex really, really appreciate that extreme level of being proactive throughout that process as well. Yeah, I think you use one phrase there that I really like. You know, you talk about, everybody thinks about follow-up in the fact of the timeliness of it. But the one phrase that you used is the carefully placed message. And one of the things, <laughs> I've been guilty of it in the past and have to remind myself constantly now, even as a salesperson is, one of these dumb phrases that we use is you were on my list to call today. Wow, that's that's great. I'm glad that, you know, you're you're churning through a list and I'm so important. And and I think you make a really good point there that when you do follow up, yes, a system in place, um, how you're gonna execute that, uh, using a tool, all that sort of thing. But more importantly, I think than any of that is you're doing this not just for your own benefit, but also the customer's benefit. You're not just selling them a transaction. Being a salesperson in general, and especially I think in the green industry, it's just, it's just really, really tough. I mean, there's so many things to remember. You're pulled in so many different directions. I, I think right now, like at my week right now, I have actually legitimately 134 tasks on my to-do list <laughs> for this week. Um, now, granted, some of those might only take me a, a few minutes, um, but I only have like five things for today. Uh, each of those five things also has a couple pieces to it as well. So that is a lot of information for someone's brain to process. You know, we're busy. We have all this information to process. Our team members that we have to involve here and there are, are busy. And our customers, like you said, are really, really busy too. So how can we leverage certain things like technology to really help a green industry salesperson totally kill it and to really focus on what's most important? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Just like your prospective customers, I'm sure you're a very busy professional, whether you're just a, an account manager, you're a business owner, whatever that might look like, there's a lot pulling for your attention, um, just professionally in your personal life and everything in between, right? So there's a lot that can pull our attention and our focus away from our core processes. And so I find that a lot of green industry professionals, they fall in this trap of trying to, the analogy I use is they use their brain like a filing cabinet. They try to have all these files of Mrs. Jones' dog's name and that gate code and what the frequency was in which they invoiced that HOA that they work with and all this just minutia and these details and it bogs down their efficiency so much because they're trying to recall that. It's like when someone mentions or you see a movie and you know the name of the actor but you can't put your finger on it, right? It's, it's this ability to be overwhelmed by all the data. And so when we use technology, you know, our brains are really much better used as an engine where we can be problem solving, being creative, being present with our, our customers. And so technology allows us to store all of that data, have it super accessible at our fingertips. And we don't have to recall from memory all these details. It acts as a catch all for all these things. And it's a tool that if used correctly, it just takes away all those non-critical details that always leave us upset and, and overwhelmed. And we know the devil's in the details with these things. So I think the, the task management is a big part of that. And also just from like going back to the sales process side, visibility is so important. Without technology, it's really hard to see how many proposals do I have outstanding? When was the last time I contacted that customer? 
what's the 30,000 foot view of my sales pipeline? Like what should I be doing business development tasks today because I'm short-sighted on my proposal numbers? Have I closed a bunch of things this, this week and I need to follow up there? And so there's a need to have that visibility and it's next to impossible to do that in your brain on your own. And it's even, in my opinion, harder when you have scattered pieces of paper or have that information scattered across all different members of your company. So that's where I think technology can be such a force multiplier for us because that coupled with our professional abilities can really just drive and move the needle for us. Yeah, I think that's something we realize the older and older that we get that our brains only have so much space for certain information. And somehow our brains determine which pieces of decide to remain there. Sometimes it doesn't make complete sense, but um, you know, we just can't retain so much. So I think a, a, being a good salesperson in the industry is really about a good partnership. Uh, it's about you know, a representative from the, the Warner Landscape Company and the customer working together and using everything at their disposal to really find mutual success. So there are tools that people should use, uh, salespeople should use in the industry uh, technological tools out there. There's a ton of them out there. And so it's really smart to take a look at those, figure out how you can become a stronger salesperson personally by utilizing them. And then also how your organization really will prosper if you start doing that across the board. Sean, I really appreciate you taking some time today. Um, I wish a lot of success for you. Um, also your team, also the, the clients that are using single ops and their clients as well. If you'd like to learn more about single ops, a uh, landscape business management software option for you, I'd encourage you to go to their website, singleops.com. That's singleops.com. Make sure that you connect with Sean Adams on LinkedIn and see some of his video tips because he turns them out a couple times a week. I'm pretty impressed with your frequency there. Um, he gives a lot of tips, not just on software and buy my product. That's not what it's about. It's about how to run an effective business, be a better salesperson and a professional in the green industry. So thanks a lot, Sean. I appreciate your time today. It was a lot of fun, Chad. Thanks for having me on. Well, I hope today's conversation has helped you identify some maybe some weak spots in your sales process or even your sales organization, which people should be selling, which people shouldn't be selling, and how you can all work together to really succeed as a company. I hope that you'll take some time and check out some of the resources that we provided in the show notes below. I have an article that Chris wrote on this topic that you'll want to check out. Also, if you'd like to learn more about what we do and read more topics related to sales or marketing, please check out our website. You can also connect with either Chris or myself on LinkedIn, or feel free to drop us an email. Thanks for tuning in today. Keep an eye out. We're going to have a couple episodes coming out each month where we're going to talk about more sales and marketing topics. Thanks a lot. If you love this episode, please forward it to a colleague or peer. Thank you so much for listening. Have a really great day.